I'm Kevin Walters, and I'm an assistant clinical professor at Mississippi State College of Veterinary Medicine. I am a theriogenologist by training, which is a reproductive specialist, but I do a fair bit of ambulatory work. We'll give you a brief tour of the truck. This is just a spare compartment, just for like storage for instance, we go <coughs> work with uh, cattle and stuff like that. So students will take coveralls and rubber boots so that we can disinfect and remove soil clothing when we get back in the truck to ride. Um, this compartment is uh, access to a variety of like managing materials, potentially, um, if we needed to do like suture of wound. I have what we call a cold pack here, so it's just a, a tray of surgical instruments that we can provide uh, liquid disinfectant to. And then obviously just a variety of bandage material. We have 4x4 four four gauze, some elasticon for providing exterior covering on bandages. These com uh, containers here just have like gauze with or hexidine scrub and isopropyl alcohol or disinfecting uh, wounds or sites for surgical. These compartments in here have suture material for suturing wounds, uh, lacerations, sterile gloves, and we'll move on to another compartment. And there's multiple vehicles in Mississippi State that uh, conduct these same activities and all veterinarians all have the trucks up, set up a little bit differently, but in this compartment I have, uh, you can see nasogastric tubes passing a, a tube on a horse or, or cattle, and then uh, a rope halter for cattle, and then I have rope halter and lead ropes for a horse, and then there's uh, multiple types of ropes in here for applying uh, tractional forces in case we have, like, say a cow in the field and we're trying to conduct a lameness. I can use the rope to be able to pick up the foot because they're not as going to be as willing to allow us to look at the sole of their feet like we can pick up a horse's foot. So we can apply the rope to that and then use a, uh, you know, a higher up bar on the restraining facility to help us lift up and maintain the limb off the ground so that we're able to evaluate. Another box. And in here we have a variety of things. Uh, the lower drawer I have right here is primarily just kind of like bottled liquids and buckets because uh, buckets are pretty handy for us on the farm where we can take uh, water and stuff to whatever uh, patient we're working on. And then we have um, just gallon jugs of disinfectants, uh, mineral oil, um, just a variety of liquids that we kind of you know keep in bulk to have while we're on the farm. And the way at least my truck is set up is this drawer is large volume injectables. Up here we have needles, sir smaller syringes for providing um, you know injection of medication. And then there's some uh, tubes in order for us to collect uh, tissue like blood for performing certain diagnostic tests. And this upper drawer is uh, injectable liquids, so antibiotics, you know, non-steroidal, uh, anti-inflammatories, and you know, minerals, vitamins, things such as that. Um, there's also sedation or tranquilizers for animals that whenever we have to do that in order to perform the procedure. Part of it is uh, this bin is actually a trash can. Um, it actually contains a uh, gallon jug and lubricant, which I use quite frequently in the work I do for pregnancy diagnosis in cattle and horses. It's actually uh, performed uh, rectally uh, by arm. And so to do that, we have what we refer to as sleeves, which are just plastic covers to put over the arm to conduct these procedures. This apartment. I keep uh, some larger syringes, so we, you know, we use some fairly large volume syringes in order to give injectables to cattle and horses, and then have a variety of sizes of exam gloves for the different people that'll be in the vehicle. And this is just an assortment of some uh, miscellaneous uh, equipment, tools, and stuff that periodically we will use. And finally, in this compartment is where my refrigerator is. And so we're able to take, you know, 
uh, cold storage with us in the field. Antibiotics, vaccines. This time of year, it's uh, good to keep yourself um, hydrated. So obviously, we we have bottles of water and you know sports drinks available to the students to keep anybody from getting dehydrated. Hey, in hospital cases, it is important to keep a first aid kit handy in case somebody gets a program. We can at least apply some uh, medical treatment to somebody. Drew a straight line from the forearm to his carpus. This cannonball here sits a little bit laterally. That y'all see that? Yes. yes. And he's got some little bumps right here on each inside. So that's probably because he's put more stress on the split bones right here. And the other thing too is you get down here to his feet and it's not perfectly straight. So you can see how it looks like he's got flare on the medial aspect of each toe. Alright. So those are the things that just glancing at him that I'm seeing. That might be leading to the cause of his lameness that's okay. been reported on the right foot, but it might not be because of the weather pattern we've been doing with lots of rain, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So it's just like you, you know, you're in a bathtub or have your hands in liquid all the time and you get soft and then he's moving around and potentially traumatize the sole of his foot, you get a little dirt bacteria in it, and he ends up with a subsolar abscess. That could very well be an issue. So that's why we're gonna Pick up the foot, examine the foot, put hoof testers on it, see if we can release the leg whether or not there's an issue with the foot. Just kind of lightly scratching. That way it gets me down to the sole where it's white. And if I was concerned about a place uh, like where an abscess might be, you'll usually have like a darker, you know, place where the dirt's been impacted in the area and then it might lead to. Can I borrow your hoof testers? Yeah might lead to the abscess. So just nope. Nope, kind of a little responsive right there across that heel. Yeah. So come up here, come around the bars, toes. I mean you can really squeeze one and make them painful. You know, just responsive just from the pressure. Right here because I kind of right. see a dark spot right here. So I'm gonna see if we can See how you just have this little black track right here? Mm -hmm. So what we do is just kind of keep following it. And it kind of fades and goes away, so that might not be our, our location. You see like right in here, you can kind of, this is your white line. And so we have some debris and stuff that's kind of the outside of that. Between that and hoof wall, so we can still have a place where it's gotten soft and debris gotten packed in there and has led to a track going somewhere from that. And now we got an area back here. Oh, he says that's tender. So now, what we'll do is show y'all, look. So you see, it's, that's pus actually coming out. See, it has this, it's like this gray liquid. And see, I can push and make it bubble up. Mm -hmm. So, that is a subsolar abscess. So it's just like your eye. Your master finger actually had one on my pinky right here. Yeah. A little <laughs> blood blister underneath the nail. But what happens, same simple situation here is that you get trauma. You, in this situation, I had, you know, it's a, a hemorrhage underneath my nail, so you got blood releasing in there. Well, that increases pressure. When your nail is hard, it's not like your skin, you know, like you get a bump on your arm, the swelling occurs and it becomes painful, but it's not terribly bad, you know, it's not excruciating where it's intolerable. This can be fairly intolerable because the fingernail keeps it contained and doesn't allow it to expand, and so it pushes internally. Very similar to this. His hoof wall and the sole are very hard, and so that basically creates a capsule where he's had a little bit of trauma because it's probably soft from being wet. And then he does a little trauma to the area that allows the debris and stuff that he's walking on 
to invade that area and it gets trapped mm -hmm. and then the microbial activity creates the pure like debris from his body's response to that and then that excess liquid and stuff increases in space causing pressure so then he's laying at a lot because it hurts because when he puts weight on it it causes an increase in pressure therefore he doesn't want to walk on her he's limping so now we have uh, provided an outlet for that to be released so what we'll do now is fix him up a bandage just to kind of like keep other material from getting packed in there and then hopefully keep the bandage on for a few days give him some nice to rural anti you know therapy for some pain and we'll probably keep him in a stall for a few days and then allow this to kind of heal up and dry out you've got a variety of ways and people will develop many different uh bandaging concepts. One thing that I use, I mean, these are pretty handy uh, uh, baby diapers that are varying sizes on the horse's foot, because you can put your material here and then affix that to the foot, and then we'll use duct tape to provide a more um, hardy barrier on the outside and, and surface, because otherwise they'll just walk through the material the diaper's made out of, but that's something that I'll frequently do. And then we can not use a diaper, you just take the material poultice that we want to put on the gauze and you know, just put it on there like vent wrap and then put some duct tape at least on the solar surface just to give them something that's a little more durable to walk on and then let them wear that for a few days and then swap the damage. It's usually at the school that like have one of the stainless cabinet doors and they just tell you to do it on there. We have yeah. right out here we don't have one of the stainless doors but this is the way I do it. I can get this tape up. So you really don't have to have very long pieces, you know, because we're just really wanting a square that's probably roughly, you know, 12 inches by 12 inches or, you know, 10 by 12, something like that. So it doesn't have to be a very large, you know, these piece. So I usually do somewhere 10 to 12 inches. And I usually start about my knee. Go down. This isn't uh, perfectly square by any means, but it's what I have to work on. It's just that line all right in there. So now what you're going to do is put a hair tool on just kind of apply the big wrap around it, and you actually come all the way up on this pasture area. You're just not going to put it real tight once you get up on the pasture and stuff, just because you don't want to. Okay. So what I do is just cut it at the corners, typically, and then that lets you kind of fold it around. So you just kind of cut in a nominal distance like so like I said it's not going to fit perfectly but then you can take these wings that we split mm -hmm. and you can pull them and wrap them kind of around the foot and what I've gotten where I do is just to give it a little bit more longevity I use the, uh, the gorilla duct tape and I'll put like two or three strips across it on the solar surface and that just makes the bandage you know, like it, it keeps him from walking through it in a couple days so if not even been in a stall he may walk through this bandage in a couple of days we'll probably keep him in a stall for I'm gonna say probably five days or so just kind of give a couple of days for the abscess to drain and then we will give him a few days after that to kind of let us fit get a little bit more healed up where that track's not draining and stuff. So we can identify, you know, fetal parts. So you can see here, there's your little heart. You can see the heart beating right here. Mm -hmm. 
we're getting a cross section basically of the trunk of the body. I'll see if I can manipulate it to get more of a profile view. This little thing's going to start moving on me, so it's going to be a little challenging because it's choosing to move right now, not stay static. Abdominal cavity and GI. So there you can kind of make out this kind of fan shape, you know, brighter hyperechoic structure. That's your ribs. And this right here is the umbilical cord. So as it's coming into your, you know, your caudal abdomen. Gestation on average 11 months. So they can range anywhere from like 320 to like 365 days plus or minus a year. So they are uh, quite lengthy and quite variable. There's potentially can become pregnant with twins, but it's less than probably 3% of the time that they would actually gestate and carry twins all the way to term. And usually what will happen is if they're unmanaged, maybe you don't know about it, uh, basically one of the feti will basically take over most of the blood supply, cause the other one to expire, and then that usually means that both of them will be terminated shortly after that. So normally it's a, a lose-all situation. On occasion, like I said, 3% is pretty small, but they'll give birth to twins, but they're usually very, very small in stature, so they usually will require lots of uh, TOC or even neonatal support. Uh, mares cannot be bred any time of the year. Uh, they are what we refer to as seasonally polyesterous. So that means that obviously seasonal meaning at some point of the year they become cyclic and then they cycle on a routine basis after they reach that cyclicity. The cyclicity pattern usually is initiated sometime late March to early April. And they will remain cyclical till October, November, sometime. So it's usually only about a three to five month period of time that they're not cycling. And that's primarily influenced at least by horses by the length of daylight. So the length of the daylight affects their brain, and that's what causes them to have hormonal buildup, and they cycle for a part of the year, and then they don't cycle for 